there is no doubt that leaders around the world have pretty big egos. But in Thailand, the egos are big enough that it's really bad form to admit you've screwed up big time. For little things, you can sort of, you know, say, you know, use humor or whatever to deflect. But if it's anything substantial, they're going to fight it. They're going to either get to or get get cow, which means they'll either um, make an excuse and dump dump it off the responsibility off on someone else, or they're going to change the story. They'll, they'll they'll figure out a way to change the story. There are no two people in Thailand, who, Thais, who are perfectly equal. They aren't. They'll always sort it out. One will be, even if they're completely the same on every level, if one is one day older than the other, then there's a, there's a little bit, just a little shade of difference. Fathers and mothers never say I'm sorry to their children because they feel it's a loss of face. They are leaders. Leaders never make mistakes. This is the way Thai people think. If a person makes a mistake, he is not a leader. Hello everybody, I'm here with Dr. Larry Persons, CEO of CQ Leadership Consulting and author of this great book that I just finished reading called The Way Ties Lead, Face as Social Capital. And today we're going to talk about the culture of face in Thailand. And um, I'd just like to give, um, I'd just like to say at the very start that I'm actually quite excited about this interview because I finished this book and I thought it was fantastic. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could interview the author of this book? So I sent um, Dr. Larry an email and he responded and here we are doing the interview. So thank you very much, Dr. Larry. Absolutely. And um, so let's start off with uh, your background, because I know you have a really interesting background. Yeah, I probably sound like the average American and look like maybe an average American, but uh, looks can be deceiving. Um, I was born here in Bangkok, where we're doing the interview, um, mm. just across the river, and uh, grew up in Jiang Wat Lui, or Lui province, which is right in the Isan, right near the Mekong River. I mean, it borders the Mekong River. And I've spent my first six years there. And then when I was six years old, went to boarding school in Vietnam. Uh, it was during the time of the, the war was pretty bad, and uh, I was there for about two and a half years and then the school had to evacuate uh, to Bangkok and then eventually to Malaysia. And so I went obviously with the school through the years and uh, graduated from the same boarding school, you know, uh, 12 years later. Uh, and what was Vietnam like when growing up or going to school in Vietnam and in the war, when the war was going on? Well, I was a little guy and it always felt a little bit uh, scary, um, but we were well taken care of uh, on the campus. Actually, they, we were in Dalat, up uh, in the highlands, or, or it's, you know, it's a nice place. It's a tourist place for, for Vietnam and cool weather. So it's, it's actually very good memories, uh, but there were often sightings of Viet Cong or whatever, you know, fairly near campus or this or that, and it just got so dangerous that the, the, our director and teachers just moved us overnight, basically, to Bangkok. So we were on uh, Wittayut Road, and, uh, which is wireless road, um, for about a year, where the Afeni Plaza Hotel is right now, actually. It used to be called the American Club, and the school was there for a year, and a little less than a year, and then went to Malaysia, to the Cameron Highlands, in the middle of a tropical rainforest, which was fantastic. Yeah. That was, those were great years, a bit like Lord of the Flies. But, um, you know, just uh, taking a, a machete with your friends and going out in the jungle and cutting vines and swinging and killing snakes and... It, those are those are great years. Um, beautiful tropical rainforest, lots of rain, and then moved to Penang where I graduated. The school's still there, actually. There, it's called Dalat International School. Cool. And so then you came back to Thailand, and or what did you do then? Yeah, I've been back and forth. <clears throat> so then I went back for my BA, got a BA in in psychology, and. Um, uh, 
immediately following that, I, did, I got married, but then uh, immediately following that, I was out, found myself out in Thailand helping the Thai government because there was a huge refu refugee crisis with the uh, Lao refugees. The Lao and the Hmong were coming across the river in droves, and uh, it was a huge crisis. There were two uh, gigantic camps up there, one in, in Lui province and one in Nong Kai. And, so for a year I worked uh, both receiving the new arrivals at the border and uh, making sure that their needs are taken care of and then I, I did projects like uh, pig projects and things within the camp so they could have raise their own pigs and so forth. Um, so yeah, that, that was quite a twist from my, my BA in psychology. Yeah, uh, you're fluent in Thai as well, aren't you? I am. I am. I, I, I probably sound like a Thai for the most part. Uh, I speak more slowly than some Thais do, and my vocabulary wouldn't be completely, you know, depending on, I guess it's like most of us, even in English, if we don't know a lot of legalese or legal terms if, if we're not, you know, in that line of work. Yeah. But, oh, I definitely have enough to, to get along, communicate, pretty clearly um, and, and even give addresses and teaching. I, I taught in Thai for, oh my, since 1987 until uh, 2010. In fact, I was the, um, I worked for an NGO that was helping to train leaders in the provinces and uh, everything was in Thai and, and I was the editor of 3,000 pages of curriculum that we did. Um, for, for that too, all in Thai. So that that's really was my background before I came and uh, started doing, doing business here. I just want you to kind of explain, because when I read this book, I thought I knew about face, but it's, it, it dawned on me just by, I mean, the first couple of pages, there, it's, it's, there's so much to learn and you think that you know it all, and then all of a sudden you, you pick up this book and you just, it's just so much knowledge. Um, it's really excellent. So. Can you give like an, a kind of an overview of, of what face is? Um, first of all, I would say that everybody does face or face, what is called face work. You and I are doing face work right, right here. You're, you're projecting a certain persona of someone who's done these kinds of interviews. Yeah. I'm someone, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to act like I know what I'm talking about, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay? And whenever we meet people, uh, face is this, it's, it's claims to worth, that we make about ourselves, either verbally or just the way we act. And then it's the response of saying whether you agree with my claim to worth. At the heart of it, we all do it as human beings. And I, and I can't say, I, I would not be an expert at face work in South Africa or face work in, in, in other places. I am for Thailand because of my deep research. But uh, basically it's, it's, it's these claims to worth and at, at the root of it, it's this. People want to know that they are um, lovable enough to be accepted and respectable enough to be, to be uh, I guess, or competent enough to be respected. And, and those, that's at the heart of it. It's these human longings for belonging in community. And so we're doing it, we do, we do face work. Does that work for you? Basically, I come from Ireland, right? In Ireland, we have a culture of kind of, if you make a mistake, if you're a leader and you make a mistake, the best thing you can do is put, hold your hands up and say, I made a mistake, sorry about that everybody. And everyone's like, okay, cool. Probably the worst thing you could do is just not say anything and deny it or lie about it and stuff like that. So in, I know in Asia it's different, I always thought, face as being you know, when someone tries to save face or any kind of face i always thought it was like ego preserve the ego i don't know if that's right or wrong that was just how i always perceived it that's 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 a valid perception it's just more complicated than that at least in thailand okay so um there is no doubt that leaders around the world have pretty big egos but in Thailand, the egos are big enough that it's really bad form to admit you've screwed up big time. For little things, you can sort of 
you know, say, you know, use humor or whatever to deflect. But if it's anything substantial, they're going to fight it. They're going to either get to or get get cow, which means they'll either um, make an excuse and dump dump it off the responsibility off on someone else, or they're going to change the story. They'll, they'll they'll figure out a way to change the story. I saw a video that you did where you spoke about scorecards and that how everybody has like kind of an invisible number, I think you used that, uh, hanging over their head and it's constantly going up and down depending on different circumstances. Can you tell us more about that and how that's connected to face? Um, it, it's rooted in hierarchy and obviously Thai games of face take place in what is quite profound hierarchy, you know, still in many sectors of the country, in many industries, in many, uh, almost anywhere you look, there's a, a certain amount of hierarchy. And the whole concept is that um, you have got to, when you meet someone new, you've got to figure out quickly uh, how, much, how much credibility, how much face, how much honor they have. And uh, the video you saw was more of a spoof in a sense. I mean, obviously nobody has scores floating above their heads, but the idea was when you come into a room of new people and you're Thai meeting other Thais, you've got to figure out where the pecking order is uh, for the most part. I mean, there are certain egalitarian pockets for sure all through the country, but for the most part, particularly in any formal situation or any new situation at work or you meet a, a, a new group of people, You've got to kind of figure out, and there, you know, the number of things you've got to look at. Who's older? Because that's the P, that's the older brother or whatever, and you're supposed to be a little bit less than them, uh, as the Nong, which is the younger brother or younger sister. And um, you know, how old are they? How, how about their education? Uh, lots of things. Their money. What's their last name? You know, it it matters. This is a culture of particularism, not universalism, uh, which means uh, it's the same rule doesn't apply to everybody. Uh, it depends on who you are and what your last name in, who, who's your daddy, okay? And um, so all of these things are going on. Well, what's your education? Did you get a degree in the UK or, or, or the United States or, or at a really good school? Oh, did you go to Jula Longcon? Oh, wow. And then occupation too, I mean, if you're a doctor, you know, uh, who graduated at, from Jula, is working in one of the top hospitals here. Here, so there's this idea that we're not all equal. And there, one statement I made there was, there are no two people in Thailand, who, Thais, who are perfectly equal. They aren't. They'll always sort it out. One will be even if they're completely the same on every level. If one is one day older than the other, then. There's a, there's a little bit, just a little shade of difference. And so they're constantly trying to figure out where am I in, in the hierarchy so that they have a feeling of place. And it doesn't mean they'll always stay there because they themselves can gain face and they'll get, they're getting older, you know, just don't get too old. Um, you know, and, and all of these changes will change the way that others perceive, others perceive you. Okay. This is something that a lot of foreigners are not, not really aware of when they walk into a room. So I'm just going to read a little passage from the book which I thought was really interesting. Leaders lose face by having to admit that they are wrong. Listen to an author and speaker as he recalls a childhood experience. I once had a dog I loved very much. If someone pretended they were going to hit me, this dog would protect me. Man, I love that dog. One day I came home and asked, where's my dog? My mother said, I sold him to a family of foreigners for 300 baht. I burst into tears. She said, we'll buy you another one. But she never apologized to me. This is deeply embedded in Thai society. Deep down, did my mother know she was wrong? She knew, I knew she felt bad, but she couldn't say the words. Fathers and mothers never say I'm sorry to their children because they feel it's a loss of face. They are leaders. Leaders never make mistakes. This is the way Thai people think. If a person makes a mistake, he is not a leader. Yeah, pretty strongly stated there. Those are actually the words of one of my 
informants. And because uh, I have loads of dozens, as you know, of anecdotes in there. Um, are there exceptions to that? Sure, I'm sure there are exceptions to that. But traditionally speaking, it is a loss of face for an authority figure to apologize. And, and that, that goes for, I, I think it is fairly rare still for fathers and mothers to get down and say, I'm very sorry, you know, for something. There must be so much stress on a leader then, if, they, if they're held in this pedestal that they can't make any mistakes or they lose face. I mean, I make mistakes every day. I mean, how can, how can you lead? I mean, I think part of being of human is making mistakes and learning from the mistakes. So I, I agree with you. And, and I think that's healthy. That's healthy what you said. But they're up against a lot of tradition here. And um, it's a game that they keep playing. They all keep pretending that they're perfect or near perfect. And they'll do a lot to try to um, con keep the dream alive. I think there are beautiful things about Thai culture, but there are also things getting in the way of real innovation. And one of them is this. Innovation happens because, like you referenced just a minute or two ago, it happens when we try something and it doesn't work quite right, and so we tweak it and we try again and we learn from it, and we, that's, that's how innovation happens. So, um, but if we are steeped in a culture where mistakes shouldn't, very few people own mistakes, to just stand up and say, sorry, my bad, I, I did that. It's a loss of face, even among your friends, even at the office level. It's mu what is much more common is to find another person or reason to blame it on, or to just lie and say it wasn't you. <laughs> um, and, 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 and so I, I think that uh, it, it's not a good way of the, of the future, okay, or a pathway for the future. I think this needs to be challenged and talked about in Thai circles among Thai people saying, really? This has got to change. I think most Thais know that there is no one perfect. But they have to pretend like certain people are perfect. In fact, in many cases, they've got to pretend like a lot of people above them are perfect. And this, this is why leaders oftentimes, when they make big mistakes, they'll throw their team under the bus. They'll find someone else to blame it on. Do you think future Thai leaders need to adhere to the practice of, of face, or do they need to adapt? It's not an either-or decision. It's, it's, it's a both-and decision. I think they need to adhere to the rules of face because they're never going away. They, can, they will morph and change with time, but they're not going away for good. And so they've, they've got to swim in those waters. Uh, but they had better learn to adapt, in my opinion. I think, I think just the fact that um, if you take a 4.0 type economy, a lot is uh, resting on the hopes that there, it's going to be built on uh, like IT and creativity and innovation and smart cities and this whole thing. And to get there, you've got to be able to lead really creative companies. And traditional Thai leadership doesn't do well leading really creative companies. Traditional Thai leadership, the traditional stuff that I write about there, and particularly, okay, government or military or anything, very hierarchical, very strung out, and it's, uh, it's very difficult to, it's, it's easy to align people, but it's very difficult to drive them quickly in, in a, in a area of new change. And so I think, I think the, one of the things, for instance, that Thai leaders need to look in the mirror again and say, are you really perfect? You know, if I, if I look in the mirror in the morning and ask myself, Larry, are you, are you really perfect? I have an instant answer to that. I know I'm not. Okay. And so um, what, when we all are going around pretending like we're perfect, 
What it takes away from us is this ability to continue to learn, to develop humility, to, um, to be open to change. And uh, so um, I believe organizations, more and more organizations are going to have to be, become more agile, even flatter, depending on the industry, in order to survive or, or be relevant. I know a lot of big uh, retail corporations are going through this very thing right now. Dr. Larry, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Now, I'm, I just want to give you a shout out into that camera. I have nearly 3,000 subscribers. I'm on 2,700 and something. No, no, 2,970. I'm like 30 away from 3,000. So can you give a big shout out and say subscribe to Tyrish Times? Subscribe to Tyrish Times. Pete's a good guy. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. I'll see you on the next one. Take care.